So while they're taking their seats, just a quick uh, kind of survey. So how many of you uh, are familiar with graph databases? OK, the majority, that's good. Then how many of you are actually using them in, in projects? OK, about, about the same people. OK. So yeah, that was actually the first uh, the trigger on how to start the discussion. Because I figured, OK, some people are going to be fairly familiar with the topic, and some others, well, it's, it's, it's only, they're, they're only getting started. So the first uh, question, uh, the first topic we're going to address is actually, how does one define a graph database? Because there, there's quite a few definitions flying around. And as I recently uh, went uh, and undertook the uh, uh, research, uh, uh, research uh, report that I started writing, actually that was the first thing I had to, to deal with. Like, okay, how do I define a graph database? So basically, where, where does the, the line uh, stand? So in my view, as, as I was going through that, in order to, to view a database system as a graph database, it has to be, well, it has to go all the way, so to put it. So there has to be an API that covers the entire, uh, it covers any, anything you can do with a graph. So both uh, transactional and analytical operations. It, otherwise, it's, I don't know, it can be a, a system that you use for analytics or it can be something that's half graph but not entirely. So your, what's, what's your take on that? How, how would you define it? Uh, uh, from perspective of uh, uh, RDF graph, um, I would say it depends. Um, the the gra graph database is, uh, or graph uh, system, gra graph system is is uh, system which describes uh, um, the data, um, which means. Um, it's quite flexible, and uh, it really depends on, on the user. But uh, mm. so to, to put it another way, if you have a system that is great at doing graph analytics but doesn't support uh, operation and operations, would you call it a graph database? Um, no, rather not. But uh, it's also fle flexible. What people means uh, uh, by operations. Uh, uh, let, let's let's imagine there's a basic CRUD system, CRUD uh, operations, uh, saving, update, uh, delete, and uh, mm, restore the data. And um, f from perspective of RDF, uh, uh, it's quite widely used. The, the the model, some operations are not active. I, I mean, uh, mm, there is some data databases system. Uh, um, there is no delete data. You can say you can link the data uh, not active, or you can describe versioning, data versioning, and uh, you can say that uh, from some version the data uh, disappeared, but, uh, but still exists in the system. You can find it, and um, the, some RDF graphs are um, um, only growing. And uh, uh, RDF uh, is quite flex flexible. The you can you can you can uh, um, uh, cut the data into different uh, subgraphs, subnodes, uh, networks, uh, and uh, it's quite easy to to merge them together, uh, do requests across them. It's quite 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 uh, flexible, but. Uh, the basic concept is simple. You just have the, you just have three um, URL URL like uh, not not notice. Uh, we describe subject, predicate, object. Something has a property and value of this property. And from RDF perspective, that's enough. Uh, you don't have to build um, big uh, you know concepts. Uh, Big philosophy. It's just quite quite simple, and from f based on the simple system, you can build up. And as a, as a, as a previous uh, previous uh, uh, lecture was quite nice because uh, uh, you could you could find you can describe some simple model, and then um, merge them together quite easily because of this three um, information: subject, predicate, object. You can merge them together. 
and build up, build up, build up, build up and uh, receive final. Let's not go in the in yeah. specifics of, of uh, RDF and keep, keep it more at a high level in the beginning. At least then we will get to what the differences are. Uh, Victor, what? Okay, so the definition of a, gra a graph database, I'll try to keep it simple. Um, it has a concept of nodes and connections or edges, um, and those are both first class data objects, and it supports CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete. Um, and then, you know, whether you have a specialty database or not, it, it's still a graph database. There's, there's room in the market. Um, I'll make this one quick observation and then hand it on. Um, someone asked me the other day, or they said, I'm using Stanford SNAP, uh, why should I use TigerGraph? And SNAP, Stanford Network Analysis Project, or uh, it basically started out as uh, algorithms and set data sets that they would share publicly because they're a research organization. Um, they now have a system where for, for loading the data. So here's a system where you can run their algorithms to try them. But it supports no enterprise operations. There's, there's no idea of backup. There's, there's no idea of security. It's uh, just like when I did my PhD dissertation, I had to create a graph storage structure. I barely, I would not call that a database. Um, I just needed something to demonstrate my algorithm. You know. Yeah, and there are a lot of those around, actually, if you look, right, we looked at all, all kinds of things. I mean, I think the question is wrong, right? Who cares, right, if you call it a graph database or not? What's your use case? What are you trying to do? You know, if you want to store your RDF in a big data warehouse, which we do at Refinitiv, then we store it and we add extra things on top of the RDF. We run a bunch of other operations. But then when we want to push that out to customers who do want the kind of database that, that Victor's described, doesn't matter. They might use Neo, they might use Tiger, they might use, use something else. And then when we talk about people doing machine learning and graph analytics, then if you're using Spark, if you're using Pregle, if you're using another framework for processing, that's fine too. I think the difference is really just the way that you think about the data. It's about adding the semantic and the meaning into that data and trying to preserve that through the process and try and use it, actually use it for something Sensible, because you can have a graph database and then do a whole bunch of very, you know, relational type things in it, right? You don't need to. Or you can try and do things that are better suited for a document database. You know, so if I'm trying to build a search engine, I'm probably going to need, you know, Elasticsearch. Does Elastic give me just enough, you know, graph query capabilities in what it has to allow me to do what I need to do? Maybe that's the right solution for you. So I think we get a little bit caught up on, well, this RDF or this or that. It, it really depends on the use case of what you need to do. You know, if you're trying to do something really, really fast, then, you know, you've got Tiger Graph, you've got the guy from MemGraph, you want to go in, into memory. It's a huge variety. It's really exciting time to be in the industry because of the variety that's, that's on offer. Um, but I think if you, you can get really hung up on the different features of the different systems, unless you have a clear idea of what it is you're actually trying to, to deliver, uh, which, is the, which is the most important thing. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with, with your comment. It's, it's, it's kind of your mindset, what, what you think about what, what is a graph. So I, I know from industry projects that have large enterprise graphs and the, they don't use graph technology for, for most of their, their, their daily work. So for, for instance, look at the, the Springer Nature SciGraph. They use Elasticsearch for, for storing their graph. And so, so they, they kind of materialize one, one step hops in, into the, 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 the JSON documents and then store it in, in Elasticsearch. And the same is for, for, for the DivBot knowledge graph. They, 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 they crawl data from the web to, and they claim to have the, the largest web knowledge graph in the world. They, they, use, they also use Elasticsearch. So it's, it, it does not offer any, anything a, a typical graph database offers you. So uh, when you would like to do to traversals, you, 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 not, you, you cannot use Elast Elasticsearch anymore. But th I think they have a graph. In, in my understanding, they, they deal with graphs. Sure, that's, that's one very pragmatic way of, of looking at this. But for example, if, if, you're, if you have a graph and you're using something like Elastic, it means that, as you 
pointed out, well, there's only so far this can take you. If you want to do traversals, if you want to do graph queries, then you have to, you have, you, you've, you've basically out, outgrown it. So one very fundamental, let's say, divide in the in the graph database world is, you know, this RDF uh, versus property model. And there's certain things that distinguish these two, and there's certain use cases that people uh, tend to use uh, each of these uh, models for. Uh, so let's let's start with with Victor this time, who is obviously in the in the property graph world, since TigerGraph is a property graph. And well, what do you think? Well, do you think that there's, there's such a big divide among these two, and what do you see people using mostly property graphs for? Um, I don't think there's a big divide. I think there are people who have, uh, it, uh, the way I see it is property graphs are general purpose. Um, RDF is uh, specialized, and if you are already using RDF and taking advantage of certain features it has, it, you would have to you know, spend a little time to rethink, well, how would I accomplish the same thing with a, a more general purpose tool where I would, it, it's not out of the box there yet, but I um, have to set up my data model and my operations to perform what I was doing before. And then you have to ask, well, why would I make that shift? Um, in a, a, yeah, again, as, as Jeff was saying, you have to look at your application. What are the demands? Is there a product out there that can satisfy those demands? So, you know, Tiger Graph is, we, we have, yes, speed on analytics, on scalable systems. Um, so we appeal to people who either have large amounts of data now or foresee having large amounts of data, want to want to be able to grow, and uh, are trying to do analytics, which ne not may not be highly semantic. Where we you know we deal with, you know, you can think of more concrete types of of objects. We're not dealing with, uh, you know concepts and, and trying to you know do logical reasoning on those concepts we could there's you can do that uh, but it's I guess the one thing I'll say uh, that I found that's when I've tried to think how would I take an RDF application and move it to property graph um, one thing is RDF I think has the idea of inheritance you can have like a, a, a class or a type and then a subtype and, and that's not something that's inherently in Tiger Graph. Uh, may, it's not inherently in property graphs in general. You could build it in, in your application. Do you want to pass this on, David? So do we have an, we have an RDF graph? Um, and I guess, wh why do we have that? I guess we're a content publisher. So we want to have a level of standardization that we publish out to multiple consumers. So we can all agree what those those definitions and those meanings of those concepts are. And actually, that's really important, have a common vocabulary. And so because we're a publisher, we publish an RDF, and it can be consumed by any RDF graph or, or property graph. Whereas if we built it in a very custom way within a particular property graph, that wouldn't be a, have been as common a way to, to kind of construct it and share it. So I guess that, that shareability and that open interoperability was the kind of reason we, we went down the RDF route. I guess, you know, we love it and we hate it at the same time. Um, it does what it needs to do. Um, there's a great community around it. There's, there are some great tools around it. I think, you know, speed and performance is always uh, a concern for us. That's improving with different technologies like Neptune's come out now. Um, and that's really exciting, right? So that that's really m made some made it easier for us to then put our knowledge graph, the RDF graph, into something that we can then get a level of performance that's, that's, that's required. I think we're, um, you know, what, what are the benefits of that? Yeah, things like having things like Shackle, for example, which we really like as a standard. We can do, you know, rules. We can do, you know, Natasha will tell you all the cool things you can do with it. Um, and so we like that, right? And we can so say as a publisher, yeah, we're using some open standards, right? And, and here it is. So that, that's, a, that's a benefit for us. Um, things like provenance as well, right? We, we, we like. I think on the property graph side, when we see customers, when, when, they, when they're using that, um, why do they choose that? I think they choose it because the, of the particular operations you can perform and the traversals. So, you know, if you're using Cypher, using Gremlin, you're using 
the graph query language in, in Tiger Graph, they're very, very powerful. Um, and, and you can do do things more easily than you can do with, uh, with something like Sparkle. Um, the downside, though, is you're creating a custom property model. And I think what we see in a number of customers, they, they, they take that and they think, yes, this graph is really exciting. But then they're having to take on a whole bunch of extra modeling work, um, which they maybe hadn't anticipated. And so I think that can be that could be an interesting curve. People think, I'm just going to take my data and, and load it in. So I guess with the idea of publishing it with the ontology and everything, it, it gives you that out, out of the box. Yeah, I, I agree with Victor that that the labeled the property graph model is, is, is more the, the general model. Everything that looks like a graph c can be converted into a labeled property graph. So if you use RDF and and most no notably the web ontology language that imposes some constraints on on your data, which are not there in in the, in the labeled property graph uh, world and and. And it has the the good thing about the the, the web ontology language and RDF is yeah it, it is a standard so it's it's much more easier to to exchange data with RDF than to exchange data from one graph database to another graph graph database. Uh, in semantic integration, we uh, currently w work on um, RDF quite intense uh, because um, it's a really powerful tool and uh, quite uh, flexible. There are some uh, RDF features uh, you can uh, we exploit uh, uh, quite strong. Uh, for example, uh, when we describe properties, uh, we, we can we can say that properties. Uh, mm, uh, has uh, inheritance, so we can uh, we can say that, uh, for example, yeah, power power of ex expression is very stronger. For example, we can say that someone likes some some another person, and uh, we can express that uh, the person is loved or uh, ador ador adorable, and uh, um, it's quite quite easy to to say that, that and, and uh, yeah, it's quite quite powerful and. Uh, there are machines uh, which uh, are called reasoners, and they can uh, um, quite go through, through the data quite deep and, and uh, um, express or um, export from RDF graph uh, the stuff which, which are not uh, directly uh, set per se. And uh, yeah. W it's qu quite powerful, uh, r really, and uh, um, there are some some features which uh, we miss uh, and uh, occurs in in, in graph um, uh, property graph stuff and uh, and tricks and tips uh, are also welcome and way of expression uh, data and describing uh, metadata. Merge with the data and uh, yeah, different um, many many environment many people work with with RDF and especially uh, academic work world uh, is, is quite strong uh, supporters uh, um, two large projects uh, or frameworks really uh, RDF for J and uh, Apache Genos and. Uh, um, Yes, in, 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 the, in the Java world, the Scala world, the JVM uh, world is quite uh, quite powerful. Okay, so yeah, you, you've already touched upon some of the key differences. So RDF on the one hand offers interoperability and also the ability to have um, richer, some more expressive semantic models. On the other hand, property graphs typically tend to, to offer faster traversal times and more, hence more, more scalability for, uh, for bigger scale. And, but actually, one very important aspect was, well, the use case. So these characteristics tend to drive you know, uh, the, the adoption patterns, let's say. So depending on what you want to do, you have to understand what's more important for you and then choose appropriately, basically. So let's switch to, to use cases. And Jeff, you mentioned earlier that in Thomson Reuters, you're using you're doing a number of things with, with graphs, so you can shed some light on the use cases. And what kind of uh, graph database do you use for this? 
So, so one use case we have is trying to deliver an improved search experience. So in that case, we are um, we're building our base level graph of organizations, of supply chain, competitors, peers, so the kind of ecosystem around a particular company. Um, and that's all in our, our RDF you know, graph store, because that's the kind of content that we're continuously publishing and pushing into our, our graph store. Um, and then we have another process where we're taking all of our inbound news, all the documents, and then we're, doing, we're adding metadata and marking up all those documents with topics, concepts, entities, and so on. Um, so then we're kind of building this kind of superset of, you know, things that are moving and changing a lot, and then the kind of base level graph. And then what we need to deliver for the individual user is, you know, right now, right this minute, which news story should I look at based on all the information that's just been, that has just hit the graph, yeah? So for that, I need to kind of pull out little subgraphs around the entity, around the topic, and run a whole range of kind of shortest path traversals. So in that case, we're using you know, a document store for the documents, then we're tagging those documents, we're pushing that um, actually RDF into the overall graph, we're pulling the subgraph that connects that up into a property graph, and then we're running all those traversals, um, you know, a huge, you know, th hundreds of thousands of traversals actually, based on the number of users, based on the number of events, to then deliver that kind of instant insight. Yeah. And so we're kind of using a, a combination of different things together in that, in that architecture. Um, as new technologies come along, maybe we could do all of that in one place, maybe, I don't know. Um, I'm sure Victor would think like you. Um, <laughs> but uh, so that, that's, that's what we've done, right? So we've kind of got this slow, slightly slow removing kind of stuff in our kind of RDF warehouse. And then when we're running those traversals, we're pulling it into a, a property graph. But we're not persisting in storing that entire data set in, in a property graph because we don't because we don't need to. We just need to run that calculation at that particular runtime. And <coughs> in our projects, we use RDF systems because we need the expressivity of of OWL and, and, and RDF. So in in all of our projects. We do have uh, ontology axioms or swivel rules, so we we need systems that are able to to execute this th this rules. So we use systems like like RDF Ox, for instance, or uh, a graph scale, which is one of our own systems that 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 does RDF reasoning on top of of a of a graph database. Actually, so so for storing and the data on disk, we use Neo4j. Could, could be any other graph database, but uh, typically we use Neo4j because it has a free community edition. But on top of that, we have OWL and RDF uh, reasoning and RDF uh, data modeling. And uh, yeah, I mean, th th that's what our project demands for, and, and th therefore we use it. So, um, as I said, uh, we have um, a few projects uh, exploiting um, quite strong reasoning and RDF systems. However, I, as I said, um, mm, there's also missing uh, features we, which we need uh, for our projects, for our clients. And uh, for that, uh, we use uh, on, on top of RDF uh, um, Another layer uh, for um, property graphs, so we can we can build uh, at the same time a property graph, uh, gremlin gremlin based uh, queries. Um, yeah, and uh, but uh, in our, for example, we have quite huge project with, um, with some company um, in uh, um, financial market, and. Um, they are interested on finding stuff which are, doesn't exist in the data directly. So we use quite strong different reasoners. And uh, our ontology is, uh, is, uh, is, um, is prepared or de described, the, described the model and uh, plus big advantage of uh, um, reasoner stuff. So reasoners uh, can consume the, the ontology. So it's, 
it uh, describes the, 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 ba the basic data, which are quite simple and, and basic. Um, uh, you can you can you can uh, find them in I don't know five or f six files, comma delimited files. But uh, then we exploit the data using the reasoners, and uh, if we miss some features, we can add uh, this uh, property graph uh, queries. Um, yeah, mi mi mix approach. Uh, yeah, mix approach. Thank you. So I was really. Uh, fascinated that that two of my colleagues mentioned uh, that their their projects or or enterprises see a need and actually are maybe now using both uh, RDF and property graphs that I guess in your case you said the the store of knowledge is RDF and and when you're publishing you're you're publishing RDF <coughs> excuse me um, but their needs sometimes when you need to do some some analytics you import it into property graph and that that fits um, some of the general use cases we see um, people may already have their data sitting in some data lake or some other uh, relational database um, but the, they have some analytical need that they're not able to achieve yet it's it's graph oriented and so they're looking for a high performance uh, property graph well they don't really care they're, they're looking for a graph, and they have a certain uh, performance requirement they have. And if whoever, they can, whoever can do it is fine with them. Um, <clears throat> um, some of the interesting use cases we've seen. Um, so in general, I, I think uh, recommend, personalized recommendation is, is good for uh, graphs that's, you know, maybe not really highly semantic, but still requires graph, uh, you know, customer 360, gathering all the data related to an individual and trying to get a very holistic, that's where the 360, 360 degree view, so you have a better understanding of that entity, whether that's a person or some other organization, um, and they're, you know, doing whether it's recommendation or uh, on the flip side, security criminal investigation um, but one other you know this is sort of a rare application but I think it's neat um, we have an electric utility that is modeling their electric distribution network and that industry also needs to do analytics on their distribution network and so they do the analytics in graph okay so it turns out that it's yeah, there, there's no silver bullet, let's say. It's not like one single system that, at least today, that can deliver any, everything that a customer may, may need. So the mixed approach seems to be prevalent. I mean, the other, one of the reasons, reasons we have the separated warehouse is that we can, it can scale horizontally, right? So we can, we use a thing called CMWell, it's based on Cassandra and Elastic and things. And, some of the guys in the room have worked with it, but it's it's something that is it it, it scales very well, nicely, right, and is very cost effective. Most of the property graph systems until now are scale up, right. So we have very large graph, and we've got obviously several versions and iterations of that that are being being you know running you know live all the time. And some of the graph systems that the pure graph databases are out there, we find that the, the in terms of performance, whether that's load times or read times or just in terms of just the, the, the actual scale of just holding that, that data set, they really struggle with that. And so that's one reason that we've, we've kept those two, those two layers separate, right? So I think the scalability is really important. And even now with something like Neptune, for example, it's still, you know, a uh, uh, scale up, right? So we have to go to the largest instance to, to load our data, then we, then we bring it down to do, to do other work. I think, you know, is, that, is our data a particularly large data set? I don't, I don't think that it is. Uh, obviously, if you have a smaller data set, it can fit into that, in, in, you know, another, another system, that, that's fine. But I think as graphs get, you know, larger and larger, that issue of can I run my centrality analytics, can I run my traversals, and can it run across, you know, multiple parallel machines, that's a real missing, uh, you know, area, right, today in, in for, for a lot of the graph systems that are in place. And that's a, that's a, that's pretty much the next question, which is probably what the strengths and weaknesses, but that, to us, that's a weakness, and that's why we, we went with the approach we did. 
I grew rough scales out. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we, actually, I think we've already sort of painted the picture of you know strengths and weaknesses of of each approach. So, and also because we we've kind of run over time, uh, I'm I'm going to turn to the audience now and let let them know if they have any questions for you. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll try to make it a general purpose answer of, okay, wh what, what do you need to address? You know, so you have nodes and edges, and at the simplest idea, you need to partition the graph. You need to put some of the nodes and edges on, on this machine, some on that one, and, and, and so on. And um, people who come from an academic perspective are all, often thinking of the challenge of doing a min cut of how do you find the cut line that cuts across the fewest edges. Um, and, and that's you know certain analytical challenge. And it's doable if you have a static data set. But if you have a dynamically changing data set, um, the answer you have today um, is not valid tomorrow. So the approach that Tiger Graph takes is we don't bother trying to find the min cut. We actually, uh, our default partitioning scheme is to do a random hashing of the vertex IDs. Um, you know, when every time a new node is created, we look at the ID and, and we randomly uh, select uh, a node where it will be stored. Um, and it's, it's all hash table lookup, so it's very fast. So it's still very fast lookup. Um, yes, there's communication from one machine to another, but we, we minimize the amount of uh, communication. And I was discussing in length with somebody earlier today why in two use cases there's really no penalty for that uniform distribution. Um, and, but I'll, I'll let other people give their answers. If, I guess that question was for me, but if anybody else, if anybody else has anything to say about uh, you know, graph partitioning. Right. Well, it's. I'm. I'm not saying that's probably shortest path might be a problematic case. Um, so the the two cases where I was laying out where there, there's there's not really significant penalty. Uh, one case maybe no penalty. Um, if you're doing a, f a full graph analysis like uh, page rank, page rank has to traverse every single edge in the graph multiple times. Um, so it doesn't matter where you put, you have to put the cut somewhere, right? Um, so it's, it's going to do the same amount of work uh, pretty much no matter how you slice the pie. Um, the other, so maybe on the other end of the spectrum, is what we call internally um, a small point query, where you're starting from one vertex and going a f one or two hops. And so you're not going to do very much traversal. Um, yes, you might, in, in the worst case, have to bounce back and forth with, with each hop. But the advantage of doing the uniform distribution is that when you're doing that type of workload, like small transactions, you're usually trying to do lots of those. And then you're actually increasing your concurrency because this one machine is busy, but all the others are, are free. And you know, by doing it randomly, the probability that, the, that another one is free is actually higher. Well, it, it works in the sense that you know we have systems in production and that our customers are happy. I'm not making any claims that it is you know, comparing how we didn't compare it to a min cut. We just said we can this is a high performance 
it, it's an easy solution to implement, um, and it and it works how it works. I have for, for PageRank. I we do have a published benchmark um, where we took. Yeah. Um, you know, if you go to our website, I, I don't want to spend my time on. I, I don't want to take up other people's time. You can go to our website and and, and look for our, our benchmark report. And we did a distributed database comparing single machine to multiple machines on PageRank. And you can download all the code if you want to verify it yourself. Other questions? So should we wrap it up here? Don't see any hands, so. Well, thanks, thanks everyone, and thank you for attending.